good morning, TMU. So Tyler Taddy, who serves with me in Nashville, said, you tell them, good morning, TMU. And if you were here when Ty was here, you've heard that a lot. And uh, I bring you greetings from Nashville, um, Johnny Artavanis and Topher and Ty Sherman and um, Josh is serving there and we'll, we, we, we probably have a hundred Californians who say I'm connected to the University, Grace Church, the seminary family and I bring you greetings from Nashville, Tennessee where it's greener than it is here, it's cooler than it will be today, it's cheaper <laughs> and people are nicer. <laughs> And I'm talking about the people outside. This is the nicest and the most joyous place to be. Well, I'm glad to be with you today. This feels familiar. I've missed you. I loved what I did. I love being with you. I, I miss it. I get it. I, I'm so thankful for it. And I'm thankful for the legacy that we share, the investors in your life. This is the greatest opportunity you will ever have, in my view, period. Um, Periodically, when I talk to parents about the university, I will tell them, you know, you're going to get a great education governed by the truth. That's why you ought to send your child here to truth-based education rooted in Scripture. Jesus Christ is Lord, the Bible's true, and everybody believes it and acts like it in terms of those who instruct and guide. And it's a great education. But you're going to get more than a great education. You're going to get a priceless opportunity. And that's because never in your life, and I'm saying it again, you've heard me say it before, will you have this many allies supporting you in the things that matter the most? From the dorm to the classroom, from the cafeteria to this court or the fields you play on, you will never have this many people helping you achieve what is real success. And so I want you to take advantage of it, which is why I want to invite you to Revelation chapter 2, and that's where we're going to start. It's really the genesis for this subject this morning, and my subject is success, how to measure it. And two things triggered this. Number one, I was reading recently of the uh, founder of Apple, the co-founder, chairman, CEO of Apple, charismatic pioneer of the computer revolution. He co-founded and served as chief of Pixar Animation Studios, member of the board of directors of Walt Disney, CEO of Apple. He oversaw iMac, iTunes, iPod, iPhone, iPad, Apple retail stores, reading the story of Steve Jobs. And what struck me in this is he died at the age of 56 and he was worth billions. He died of pancreatic cancer. And he was a Buddhist. He's buried in an unmarked grave in Alta Vista Cemetery in uh, Palo Alto, California. He had notables. Coldplay was at his memorial service. Nora Jones was that kind of guy, successful. But what got my attention was what his sister said when she described his final words before he died of cancer. She said he uttered three times, three monosyllables. He lost consciousness and he died, but before he died, he said her words, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. And then he passed. What triggered it was, I wonder what the oh wow was about. And I can't help but think, a guy that in measuring stick metrics of our culture, you would have to call Steve Jobs successful if you measure success a particular way, as a businessman would or as a marketer would. But I wonder if the oh wow was, oh wow, I missed it, oh wow, I missed it, oh wow, I missed it, oh wow, I didn't get it, oh wow, I'm wishing something different than I'm experiencing today. I I cannot fathom the idea that the oh wow was, oh wow, I did it right. The idea that you can be successful and in the ways that matter the most not be successful is sobering. I was listening to Tom Brady last weekend. He's in the booth for the NFL and the guy's been to 10 Super Bowls. 
won a bunch of them. Tom Brady successful? Well, depends on how you measure. Or even in the city of Los Angeles, LeBron James. Or Warren Buffett, who gave away millions this past year. Philanthropist, businessman. Successful? Well, it depends on how you measure success. And so I wanted to talk about true success in the two opportunities I have with you. Today I want to focus on the priority. And on Friday I want to talk about the key practice. Because you can be successful and not be successful. And you can be fruitful even as a Christian and not be successful. And you might say, well, Harry, what do you mean by that? And that's why this passage is the beginning point, Revelation chapter 2, because it is a sobering revelation about the perspective of God as it relates to success. And I want you to be successful. I want these to be the best years of your life. I want you to be successful, not because, and you may say, hey, success for me is I'm a valedictorian. I I, uh, success for me is I make the all-conference team. Success for me is I get a scholarship to graduate school. Success for me is I graduate. You can be fruitful and do all those things and not be successful. Look at Revelation chapter 2, familiar portion of Scripture, but it struck me this past week as I was reading it, which is why we're talking about it. Jesus Christ walking among the seven golden lampstands representing the churches. So he is reflecting on the churches, seven of them. The very first one, the church at Ephesus, verse 1. Now look at verse 2, Jesus evaluating the church at Ephesus. Feel these words. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, that you cannot endure evil men, And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance. You've endured for my name's sake. And you've not grown weary. You perform. You're active. You're doctrinally careful. You're zealous to deal with falsehood and doctrinal failure. Look at verse 4. But... See the adversative conjunction? Despite all of that fruitful performance, I'm acknowledging it. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And you, therefore, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds which you did at first consequentially or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand, i.e. your influence, out of its place unless you repent. Metanoia, change your mind, turn around, take a different path. Watch verse 6. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans were the indulgers, the idolaters, the, the live by grace, don't care about the holiness of God, people that were ungodly, carnal, and immoral. You hate them. I hate them. That's good. You work hard. You sweat. You invest. But I have a problem with you because it's not success, acceptance for me, and what matters to me. It's not what you do first. It's not what you hate and the doctrinal impropriety or the 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 false teachers you address, or the Christians who parade as Christians that don't live as Christian. Listen, that's good. It's just not the heart of the matter as it relates to me. What I want you to do is focus on what matters the most to me. The true measuring stick of success, what honors me, is not what you do for me. It's not what you know about me. It's not about the false issues of Christianity that you speak about or deal with. It's about your heart for me. Do you love me? I want you to 
pursue and return. Get back to the priority of true success in the eyes of God, and that is that you love me, your first love. Yes, it's first in time, like where you started. But you would be wrong to think it's limited by a time focus. It's a statement that says, this is the first, the priority, the top of the food chain, love. It's what you started with, and somewhere along the line, you've lost it. Now, as much as I love this university, and I do, You can go to this institution of higher learning. You can get the best doctrinal truth training in the world. You can get a high-end degree and get a high-end job and not be successful because you can know it, you can act like it, but you don't have a heart for the God who's given you the opportunity for it. The measuring and the maximizing of your life is grounded in reality as it relates to the first love of Jesus Christ, loving God first. Turn back with me to Mark chapter 12, and this is our text. That was the trigger for the text. So the title, Measuring and Maximizing Your Life, True Success. And what we're about to read is the statement of Jesus Christ when he's questioned about what matters to God the most. What commandment is most important? And this, therefore, when we read it, will provide you a calibration, a compass, if you will, so that you know the measure and motivation for all that matters to God. Are you successful? Well, it depends. How successful are you by this measuring stick? And what is the motivation that drives your journey of grace? You're in Ephesians. You're in Christ. You're the recipient of bombastic blessings. You can enjoy all of that and not have this. Chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians says, walk in a manner worthy. Worthy of what? Your calling. What's your calling? All of the rich treasure that is yours by God's grace through Jesus Christ, by his sovereign selection of you, by his son's redemption and rescue of you, by the spirit of God who seals you and guarantees all of the promises given to you, you who were dead made alive by the grace of God, you who are a slave and depraved and doomed as a child of wrath, God, by his mercy, by his great love with which he loved us, rescues us. That's Ephesians. You're getting there on how far in you are. There's probably no bigger, better book in the Bible to communicate what it means to be a Christian and all the treasure, the riches, the blessing that is yours. It is bombastic. It's big. But you can have all of that and not give God what he deserves because of that. And it's not about what you know first. It's not about what you do first. It's what you have in here first. This is the engine because you can be fruitful and not successful. All right, let's read the verses and then I want to unpack hopefully would benefit to you today, its substance and weight. So a scribe, verse 28, Mark 12. And I'm picking Mark 12. This is in Matthew 22. It's in Luke chapter 10. But I'm picking Mark because Mark is kind of the fullest expression of this transaction between this legal lawyer, a scribe. And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing. The the Sadducees were arguing about the answer Jesus had just given about the resurrection and whose wife is she. Verse 28, and one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he, that's a reference to Jesus, had answered them well, he asked him, the scribe, the legal expert, the Mosaic law, asked Jesus, what commandment, now watch this, and you should circle it if it's not circled in your Bible, which one is the foremost of all? Protos, it's, which one is at the top? 
There are 613 laws given to Moses. 365 of them are negatives. Thou shalt not. Don't do this. 365 things that you need to avoid. One for every day of the year. 248, the rabbis said, for the generations of men. 248 are, you should do this. Make sure you do this. They're more positive and directive. 613 of them. One of the debates among the rabbis and the legal scholars is which one of those is at the top of the food chain? Which is the protos one, the foremost one, the one greatest in weight, one in greatest significance? And you could suggest, if you hadn't heard Jesus' answer, you could believe and anticipate that he'd say, listen, if God said it and he told you to do it or not do it, they're all important, which would be true. But what Jesus answers in this, this question with triggers an understanding of what drives the not doing or the doing. What's the heart of it? What matters the most of God? What is the measure and motivation of what matters to God? Because Jesus answers the question, and he doesn't give 613 things and says they're equal. Oh, yeah, they're all important to God, but they're driven by the thing most important to God. So this is why you hear these words in verse 29. Jesus answered the question. And he said, the foremost is. And I want you to notice the, the verb is. It's singular. In other words, he's going to lump three things together and call it, this is the commandment. It's got three facets, but it's one reality. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment, singular, greater than these, plural. So you've got three facets that rec are recognized by Jesus as cardinal, critical, highest, the engine, the source for what matters to him. And the scribe, verse 32, said to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, reference to God, and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself, watch this, is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, all of the prescriptive expressions of true worship given by God through Moses, this is greater, much more, even those activities prescribed by God. Verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, Intelligently means he had used his head, he was right on target, and Jesus said to him, you, scribe, are not far from the kingdom of God. And after this, no one would venture to ask him any more questions because of his profound answers. Now, before we begin, I want you to understand you can know this and not enjoy the benefits of this. He said, you get it right but you don't have it because you're not far. And not far means you're near, but you're not in. You can know this. You can measure yourself by this and not have this. And that's my concern for the privilege you, you share. You're in a place where you're near it. You can know it, and you might not have it. And if you don't have it, you're near, but you miss it. All those treasures in Christ, you're around it, but you don't taste them. Because this is the measuring stick that validates whether you have them. This is the true measure of your life. So let's walk our way through quickly in the time that we have. And these are key thoughts coming out of this passage by which you can measure your life. Questions to ask. Am I successful? Well, here's the first thing. Ask yourself, am I constantly acknowledging the God as God? 
and does God alone. I think it's interesting, and you should note it, that verse 29 begins with what's called the Shema, the Hebrew word for hear, which begins this sentence is the Hebrew imperative Shema, hear. Like, hey, listen up. It is a declaration. What God wants is the declaration, proclamation, acknowledgement that Yahweh is our God. Not something else, not an idol, not the one in the mirror, not the one around you, not the thing you like. There is one God constantly acknowledging, listen up, O Israel, all of the people in your sphere, the Lord Yahweh is our God and He is one Lord. Plurality and unity. Literally, He's one of a kind. There isn't anybody like Him. So it's the declaration that God is uniquely our God and he is unique like no other because they had a plethora of gods. And this is the daily declaration. Please listen to this. You love me. You want to honor me. You want to do what matters most to me. You acknowledge me as God and God alone. And you not only constantly acknowledge it, you declare it in a way where others hear it. You are God, and nothing else is God. You're one of a kind, and you're first. The word one is one not just in his nature, three in one, three persons, the Godhead, plurality and unity, but you're you're one of a kind, and you're first and highest in priority. You want to be successful? Oh, by the way, the Jews said this every morning and every evening in their home. Every synagogue service started with it and ended with it. Over top of every door of a Jewish home and every room in the Jewish house, there was a little pouch, mezuzah, it was called. And in the mezuzah was these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. As if to say every room you walk into Every time you leave the house, every morning and every evening, every synagogue service, in our case, every chapel, every dorm room, walk in it and say, hey, I've got a declaration to make. God is God alone. He's our God, and there is no other, and he's first in priority. He has no competitors. I'm not God. You're not God. That's not God. He's God. I can't help but take away from this that every day, if you want to honor God with what matters most to God, is the acknowledgement of who's God and who is not. And you know why you say it every day? You know why you have it over the door? You know why it's in front of you all the time? You know why you're telling somebody else to listen to it? It's because we're inclined to forget it. So, Ask yourself this question, am I successful? Then, therefore, am I constantly acknowledging the God as God and God alone? God, you're alone, God. Nobody competes with you. I acknowledge it, and I want to live like it. Well, how should I live like it? Well, that's the point of verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. We call it the great commandment and the one like unto it. What is the commandment about? Well, let's break it down generally. Number one, it is about love. It's about love. And the Hebrews, and even at the time when Jesus was saying this in the culture that he was in, love was the all-inclusive affection. The word literally has to do with a special devotion. When you have warm regard, you treasure, you cherish, you you have affection for, you have high esteem for. Listen, the God who's God alone deserves and desires to be loved with a unique affection. No competition, which is why Jesus said, you don't hate father, mother, sister, and brother, you're not worthy of me. Because whatever those affections which are legitimate compared to this highest affection... There's a good distance. It's like hate and love. Love me is an all-inclusive affection. It is the highest affection. But get this, love in that culture and love by biblical definition is never just an affection and an expression. It's an action. 
It's committed action. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I can't tell my wife I love her and not act like I love her. Because love is not just an emotion, a passion, an affection. It's not just a cherishing of someone. It's an action that displays that affection. I want you to notice the words with, with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So it's a Greek preposition, ek, out of, like exhaust, exhale. It's from the inside out. I think that's noteworthy, denoting source. This is not outside love. This is inside out love. This is not plastic. It's not hollow. It's not religiosity. It's not Christian ease. It's out of me, love. Number three, notice the word all. The word all introduces two ideas. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. All means all, whole, comprehensive. Not part-time and not partial. And it's intensive. It's volume. It's not just breadth. It's depth. It's all in love. Everything you've got, love, fall on, nothing held back, love. Honoring love, listen to this, is whole life love. Loving God is not part of your life, it is your life. We tend to compartmentalize and segregate. Sundays are for God, really for most Americans that means uh, one hour on Sunday. Might be daily quiet time, 20 minutes a day, maybe three days a week. Church is for God, but work, school, or leisure is for you. And Jesus would say, that's not true. All your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all the time. Last thing I would like you to notice by way of general observation, success involves love. It's out of you, inside out. It's all of you, comprehensive and intensive. And thirdly, your heart your mind, your soul, your strength. It's personal. The command is for you, individually and personally. It's you and God that God is measuring by. You know, we can look at somebody else and say, well, I'm doing better than they're doing. I love better than they love. And the measuring stick isn't somebody else. The measuring stick is you. The measuring of yourself by yourself. Is this all I've got or part of what I could have given? These are general observations. Let me highlight the specific expectations or prescriptions. Love God with all your heart. I'm going to give you four things in the 12 minutes we have remaining. Love God with all your heart. Number one, this is, if you're going to love God the way God deserves and desires, if you're going to be successful, he wants you to love him with an all, listen to the words, all in resolution of your heart. The Greeks and the Hebrews looked at the heart as the control center. And because you have different words talking about the whole person, you have nuance. You have categories of focus. The heart word in this context has to do with the central control center of your life. It's the core of your being. Watch over your heart, Proverbs says, with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. It's the control center. It's the the depot where all the decisions are made. Your heart in this context is where you decide. And what Jesus is saying matters to God is you decide to love me with your will, committed to me in your will center, your heart. You're not dating me, love. You're not checking me out. You're not, hey, if I like you, I'll continue to pursue you. This is marriage love. This is I am committed to you with all my heart. This is not fair weather love. It's not conditional love. It's not situational love. It is covenant commitment from my heart. I choose to love you. An all-in resolution of your heart. It's not fickle. 
It's a commitment of your will. The distinguishing feature of this particular ex expectation of God is I want you to be committed to me in love. An all-in resolution of your heart. Number two, an all-you've-got passion of your soul. The first word, heart, has to do with where you decide. The second word has to do with where you feel. Suke, the word for soul, it's closest to what we would call emotion or passion. It literally means breath. It's life. What's life to you? I want you to love me like that. This is the word that Jesus cried out in the Garden of Gethsemane the night he was arrested. My soul is deeply grieved. It's where I'm feeling. It's where my passions reside. Emotions and passions, the core of you, the breath of you. Now, some people say music is my life or athletics are my life, my children are my life. That's this. This is life to me. I remember when Derrick Rose was drafted by the uh, Chicago Bulls first in the 2008 draft. He was a uh, college basketball player, played at Memphis, played one year. He holds the record for having the most victories in one year in college basketball. He's the youngest guy to ever be the MVP of the NBA 2011 at the age of 22. Derrick Rose became the MVP of the NBA, youngest ever. And Adidas signed him in an endorsement deal, and they created a, a sneaker, a shoe, which is common, like Kobe has his shoe, LeBron has his, everybody's got uh, Jordans, all of that. Well, Derrick Rose has a shoe. And they did a commercial for Derrick Rose by Adidas. And it captures this life to me idea. Because what they show is a series, a collage of pictures of Derrick Rose's life, Derrick Rose's lifestyle. They show his exotic Italian cars. They show his big house. They show his glitzy lifestyle. They show the glamour of his life. And then you hear Rose say, after all of this collage of pictures, you hear him say, if you took it all away, the glitz, the glamour, the cars, the home, he pauses. And then he says, what would I have? And then they show a shot of Derek in a gym dunking a basketball and after he dunks the basketball he says if you took it all away what would I have everything because my life isn't those things my life is basketball it's the passion of my life so let's translate that into this verse what is life to you academics music athletics some guy, some girl, some goal. Let's tell you what matters most to God. This is the measure of motivation for everything. I'm life to you. Not the kids you'll have, not the places you'll go, not the books you'll write, not the families you'll enjoy, not the degrees you will earn, not the stuff that you own. I am your life. Treat me like that. That's what matters to me. Love me with all your soul. Thirdly, love me with all your mind. So it's an all-in resolution of your heart. It's an all-you've-got passion of your soul. And listen to these words. It's an all-on intention of your mind. Love me with all your mind. Dia noia. Noia is the word for mind. Dia is a prefix which intensifies it. Your deep thoughts. Mind involves the intellect, your thoughts, your reasoning. It has to do with loving God by knowing God and seeking to know more about God. This is reading, reflecting, studying, meditating, writing, remembering. This is dedicating your mind to the knowledge of God and the ways of God. Dedicating your mind to knowing God through the Scripture. You want to love me with your mind? You've got to use your mind. You've got to learn with your mind. You've got to read and think and meditate so that you can know God and the ways of God. This is love is not blind affection. It is informed by truth devotion. You know me with your mind. So the big idea, how successful are you dedicated? Of the word dedication. Committed with your mind. It's intentional. 
It's comprehensive. And there's another thought behind this idea of mind. It has not just dedication to learn, but concentration to pay attention. Look, there's a relational reality that's been documented sociologically that being present with someone is the most important expression of love for that someone. Graham D. Bodie, professor of communication at uh, Louisiana State University, did a study on relationships, and he said, having your ears open, your eyes open, and your mind open. In other words, paying attention and being present is critical to the richest of relationships. Being present with someone, listening to what they have to say, not just waiting your turn to speak. When you focus... And in a world where you have so many distractions, you have something in your hand that buzzes and dings and it distracts you, it is hard to pay attention. Listen, the, the, uh, the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. In the year 2000, the uh, average attention span was 12 seconds for a person. And in the year 2012, research, Associated Press, says in 2012, we went from 12 seconds to 8 seconds attention span. Remember, goldfish is 9 seconds. And now you have iPhones and electronic mediums whereby you're distracted. God says, I want you to love me with this undistracted. I want you to focus on me. It's like dinner table at my house. You can't have your phone at the table because somehow the people at the table expect me to pay attention. And you know who else expects us to pay attention? God expects us to pay attention. Tuned in, turned on, all on intention of the mind. I want to say one more thing before we go to number four and finally. I want you to love me with your mind has to do also with the word protection. I don't want any competition. Loving God with all your mind involves loving him by promoting his honor and truth in your mind and with your mind. Be careful what you put in your mind that competes with God. I want you to love me with your mind. And there is music and images and movies and books and stuff that you put in your mind that handicaps you and prevents you from fulfilling what matters most to God about you. I used to have a guy in my church who ran a high-performance automobile shop, and Mac Tool guy would come by and sell him the high-end tools and always leave a poster with a Mac Tool girl. And Jim had Mac Tool girls all over his garage. And I walked in one day and I said, Jim, has your wife ever been in this place? Because if she ever comes into this place, she's going to kill you and you will never see this place. Because she's not going to tolerate all of the rivals and the competition. Because you made a claim and I married him and you made a claim in front of me and a whole lot of other people that it was her and her alone. Forsaking all others. You said that in public. Now, who else wants that kind of commitment and protection? And that's why David said, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. I'm not going to put something in my mind that competes with the God I love with my mind. I walk with integrity in my house because God might show up and I might be accountable. Protect your mind. The books, the art. Rich thoughts, not corrupt thoughts. And don't exchange good stuff for the sake of entertainment. Finally and fourthly, love God with an all-out effort. Love God with all your strength. Now, this is a profound thought, but it sits on the surface. Sweat for God. The word means to exert. It's not running wind sprints at half speed. This is Olympic effort. This is work. It's why Paul said, I labored in hardship night and day. 
I gave you my best effort. And what God is saying, what matters to God, the motivation and the measure of your life is when you're giving your best for the best as it relates to your effort. Your effort in service, your effort to assemble, your effort to study, your effort. Give God your best. Why? Because you love Him. If there's anything I've observed, people do the most extraordinary things when they love somebody. One of the seven wonders of the world is the Taj Mahal. $827 billion, 20,000 artisans built the Taj Mahal. You know why it was built? It was because some guy loved a girl. And he built the crown of palaces for her. It took 20 years to build it. And he built it as an expression of love. No expense spared. Several years ago, I was at Grace Church at Crossroads, and Austin Duncan asked the students to communicate if anybody had gotten engaged. Do you have a story to tell about how you got engaged? And I'll never forget this. I'm at the back of the room, and some guy stands up. And he says, yeah, I'll tell you. I just got engaged. Well, tell us how you got engaged. This guy was a fireman. So he wrote a book and published it, and it was entitled, The Fireman and the Princess. And then he gave the book to his girl as his proposal, this story. And the story culminated with the fireman on his knees proposing to his princess. Dude, that's a lot of effort. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to draw pictures. I'm going to put a cover on the book. You know what happens when you love somebody? There are no boundaries. You'll do whatever you can do to express that love and affection. If you understand, would you say amen? All right, so teammates, Masters University, you want to be successful? Measure yourself by that. All in resolution of my mind, I'm committed to you, God. God, I'm giving you all I've got because you're life to me. Three, ah, I have my mind. I'm thinking about you. I want to know you. I'm dedicated to you. And I'm going to sweat for your glory because I love you. The measure and motivation of your life is one big word, love. And what I don't want is you to leave here today thinking that being here pleases God. Loving God pleases God. And taking advantage of learning what you can learn here for the glory of God. Oh, one final thing. And the best way to grow that love is to think about the way he's loved you first. We love God. 1 John 4, 19. Bury this in your memory. You may know it. We love God because he first loved us. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved his, us and sent his son to be a satisfaction, a propitiation for our sin. And not only for our sin, but for the sins of the whole world. Love God back because he's loved you first. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to declare the priorities that we can be around and know and still miss Lord, I pray that the students of the Master's University will be successful in the ways by which you measure success, that they'll be motivated out of affection for you, and that affection validated by their love for you. And then, Lord, what else he said is, and that affection is validated by the way we love each other. You love God, who you have not seen. You're going to love your neighbor who you have seen. Help us to that end. For your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.